This is a homily for the first Sunday of Lent. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 1, verses 12 to 15. The liturgical season of Lent began on Ash Wednesday, and Easter this year falls on Sunday, March the 31st. Because the date of Easter is calculated according to a lunar calendar, it can fall anywhere between March the 21st and April the 25th. Our English word Lent comes from the Anglo-Saxon lengthen, which means springtime, which is when Lent occurs in the Northern Hemisphere. Lent is a 40-day period of preparation for the celebration of Easter. However, in the first three centuries, the period of fasting and preparation for Easter did not, as a rule, exceed two or three days. The first mention of the period of 40 days occurs in the canons of the Council of Nicaea, which was held in 325 AD. During the early centuries, from the 5th century onwards especially, the observance of the fast was very strict. Only one meal a day was allowed, flesh meat and fish, and in most places even eggs and dairy products were absolutely forbidden. From the 9th century onwards, this rigorous fasting was considerably relaxed. In the course of the last few centuries, the Holy See has substantially mitigated the law of fasting. Once Lent was established in the 4th century, it was soon associated with Christian initiation, since Easter was the great baptismal feast. Lent became a time of more intense preparation for those catechumens preparing to be baptised at Easter. Pope Paul VI, in his 1966 Apostolic Constitution, Painetemini, emphasised the trend towards a greater emphasis on forms of penance other than fasting and abstinence, particularly on exercises of piety and works of charity. According to this Constitution, abstinence was to be observed on Ash Wednesday and fasting, as well as abstinence, was to be observed both on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. Abstinence in this context refers to abstaining from eating meat. I can recall as a young child being encouraged to give something up for Lent, and that was very much part of Catholic culture at that time. More recently, however, the ascetical side of Lent has faded into the background. Maybe it's an aspect of Lent that we need to recover. What do we mean by asceticism? The dictionary defines an ascetic as, firstly, someone who lives a life of austerity, especially for religious reasons, and secondly, someone who leads an abstemious life, and thirdly, someone who is rigorously abstinent or austere. That definition makes asceticism sound rather forbidding and fanatical, something practised by zealots or religious fruitcakes. But let's have a look at the etymology of the word asceticism. Asceticism comes from the Greek word askesis, which means exercise or training. I'm sure, therefore, that many of you are ascetics in the literal sense of the word. You try to keep fit by exercise or training. Christian asceticism is a way of telling us that just as we have to keep physically fit by appropriate exercise and diet, we also need to keep spiritually fit. Let's now have a quick overview of our Lenten journey this year. On this first Sunday of Lent, 
the Spirit drives Jesus out into the desert, where he remains for forty days. There he is tempted by Satan. On the second Sunday of Lent, Jesus ascends a mountain in the company of Peter, James and John. There, in their presence, he is transfigured, and Moses and Elijah appear to them. The Gospels for the first two Sundays of Lent have come from the Gospel of St. Mark, but the remaining Sundays are taken from the Gospel of St. John. On the third Sunday of Lent, Jesus enters the temple, where he finds people selling cattle and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting at their counters. He makes a whip out of some cord and drives them all out of the temple. On the fourth Sunday of Lent, Jesus tells Nicodemus that the Son of Man must be lifted up, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. On the fifth Sunday of Lent, Jesus says that the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you most solemnly, unless a wheat grain falls on the ground and dies, it remains only a single grain, but if it dies, it yields a rich harvest. The opening word of Mark's Gospel is Ache, which means beginning the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah. So Mark tells his readers that they are at the beginning of a story. But by using this word, he also looks back to another beginning, the story of God's creation of the world recorded in the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis also opens with the word beginning, ache, in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. So Mark is subtly signalling that a new creation is now at hand. The brief prelude to Mark's Gospel begins with the proclamation of John the Baptist. Jesus is then baptised, and then the Spirit drives Jesus out into the desert. Jesus is baptised by John in the waters of the Jordan. The Spirit, who has just descended upon Jesus at his baptism, now drives him out into the desert where he is tested by Satan. By juxtaposing these two episodes, Mark is making a theological statement. Jesus' baptism in the Jordan before he begins his public ministry evokes the people of Israel passing through the waters of the sea as the great exodus journey begins. And just as Jesus was tested in the desert, the 40-year sojourn in the desert is also a time of testing for God's people. So here in chapter 1, Mark is announcing that his gospel is about a new and greater exodus. Tom Wright reminds us of the importance of the Exodus for the people of Israel. The most deeply formative narrative in all Judaism is the story of the Exodus, Israel's release from slavery in Egypt. Jacob's descendants have multiplied and have become slaves in Egypt. The Egyptians are harsh and bullying taskmasters. God hears the cry of his people and comes to deliver them. Jesus' baptism in the Jordan and his testing in the desert are coded dramatizations of the Exodus, hinting strongly that the new Exodus is about to take place. But Mark's Gospel is not about an Exodus from slavery in Egypt. In Mark's worldview, This world is enemy-occupied territory. An evil power has made itself, for the present, the prince of this world. The world, as a whole, is the house of the strong one, Satan's territory. 
Throughout Mark's Gospel, Jesus does battle with Satan, unclean spirits, demons, and Beelzebul. In casting out unclean spirits and healing the sick, Jesus announces that God's rule is at hand. A new exodus has begun. A regime change is underway. Mark tells us that following the baptism, the Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the desert. Mark uses the word euthos a number of times in the early chapters of the Gospel. It can be translated as immediately or at once, and it conveys a sense of urgency. Mark then uses a strong verb, ekbalein, to describe the action of the Spirit. It means to drive out. Mark uses this verb for exorcisms, when Jesus casts out demons. Elsewhere, it is used with overtones of coercion. Perhaps a more literal translation would be to say that the Spirit hurls Jesus out into the desert. Alessandro Pronzato makes an interesting reflection on Mark's use of this verb and what it says to us today. Jesus is driven out into the desert to fight his own battle there. The Spirit does not cosset the believer, gives him no guarantee of good weather, has no insurance policies for his faith. The believer is instead driven out into the world to fight his own battles there. He is driven out of the security of structures where everything functions smoothly. So, the baptism of water is followed by the baptism of doubts, contradictions and dangers in the world. It is the battle of the desert. It is a battle without ceasefires. It is a battle to the finish. So Jesus is driven out into the desert and there he is tested by Satan. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew verb satan means to oppose, to accuse, or to trouble. As a noun, it refers to humans or angels who cause someone trouble. In the early Second Temple period, the term ha-satan, the accuser, begins to refer to a member of the heavenly court who, while still subservient to God, was able to exercise some initiative on his own. We have a perfect example of such a figure in the book of Job. The second temple period dates from 516 BC. In the second and third centuries BC, Satan emerges as a clearly defined being. He was the supernatural leader of the forces of evil. It is this figure, Satan, whom we encounter in today's Gospel. In the desert, Jesus is being tested. The Greek word that Mark uses is peradzominos. New Testament scholar Joel Marcus explains that this word can be used in a positive sense for trying to determine a person's metal, or in a negative sense for trying to find a person's weakness or to entice him to sin. The negative sense predominates in the New Testament. Unlike Mark and Luke, who record three specific temptations, Mark does not portray Satan as enticing Jesus to commit any particular sins. The emphasis instead is on the implacable hostility between the two combatants. So, Jesus is tested by the evil one at the beginning of the Gospel. I'm sure that Mark wants to remind us of another story that begins with temptation. In the book of Genesis, God tells the man and the woman he has created that they may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden with one exception. They are not to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The serpent 
tempts the woman who takes and eats the fruit and then entices her husband to eat. As a result, the man and the woman are exiled from the garden. While at home in the garden, the man and the woman lived in harmony with the wild beasts. The serpent tempts them and they fall. The harmony of Eden is shattered. In the desert, Jesus is tempted by Satan and triumphs. The harmony of Eden is restored and Jesus is now with the wild animals. Here Mark is subtly pointing to Jesus as the new Adam, and his gospel is about a new creation. The prophet Isaiah foresees the dawning of a new world order, characterized by peace and tranquility between animals, and between animals and human beings. This is symbolized idyllically by domestic and wild animals, predators and prey living together, and young children dwelling safely among them. The wolf will live with the lamb, the leopard lie down with the kid, calf, lion and fat stock beast together, with a little boy to lead them. The cow and the bear will graze, the young will lie down together, the lion will eat hay like the ox, The infant will play over the hole of the adder. The baby will put its hand into the viper's lair. No hurt, no harm will be done on all my holy mountain, for the land will be full of knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. New Testament scholar Joel Marcus offers this observation. In the Old Testament and later Jewish writings, the enmity between human beings and wild animals is regarded as a distortion of the original harmony that existed between them in Eden. In the eschaton, that enmity will be reversed, as we saw in the passage from Isaiah, and God will make for humanity a new covenant with the wild animals, so that people may live in peace with them once more, as we find in the prophet Hosea. Mark apparently believes that this restoration has now happened in Jesus, the new Adam. The passage from the prophet Hosea referred to is as follows. When that day comes, I shall make a treaty for them with the wild animals, with the birds of heaven and the creeping things of the earth. Pope Benedict says this about Mark's account of the temptation of Jesus. Jesus, we read, was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. The desert, the opposite image of the garden, becomes the place of reconciliation and healing. Wild beasts are the most concrete threat that the rebellion of creation and the power of death pose to man. But here they become man's friends, as they once were in paradise. Peace is restored, the peace that Isaiah proclaims for the days of the Messiah. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. Once sin has been overcome, and man's harmony with God restored, creation is reconciled too. Creation torn asunder by strife, once more becomes the dwelling place of peace, as Paul expresses it when he speaks of the groaning of creation, which waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Let's now consider the significance of Jesus spending 40 days in the desert. Many of the key images in Mark's Gospel are drawn from Israel's scripture, and unless a reader is able to discern the significance of these images, they will find it difficult to understand Mark's message. But Mark doesn't make it easy for us. He rarely points explicitly to correspondences between Israel's scripture and the story of Jesus. Readers are left to make the connections 
for themselves. The number 40 immediately evokes the 40 years that the people of Israel wandered in the desert before entering the promised land. The desert was a place of privileged encounter with God, but also a place of physical and moral trials, of temptation and sin. More specifically, the book of Exodus tells us that Moses remained on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights. So the desert is a place both of testing and revelation. Mark's account of the temptation of Jesus tells us that Jesus was ministered to by angels. That evokes an episode from the first book of the Kings, the prophet Elijah, fleeing from the wrath of Queen Jezebel, spends 40 days in the desert. There he is ministered to by an angel who provides him with cake and water. Let's now return to the desert. I spoke two weeks ago about an important rhythm in the life of Jesus, the time with others, healing the sick, casting out unclean spirits and teaching and the time alone, the time in a deserted place. That rhythm must also find a place in our own lives. How can the time alone, time in the desert, make us truly alive? I'd like to share some observations on the desert made by three contemporary writers from different religious traditions. Alan Jones, an Episcopalian priest, is the author of Soul Making, The Desert Way of Spirituality. John Chrysippus, a deacon in the Greek Orthodox Church, is author of In the Heart of the Desert, The Spirituality of the Desert Fathers and Mothers. And Alessandro Pronzato, a Catholic priest, is author of Meditations on the Sand. I'll begin with Alan Jones because he explains exactly what we mean by the desert in the spiritual life. The desert is not primarily a place, it is an experience. It is not a setting, it is a state of soul. It is a place of revelation, conversion and transformation. A true revelation is a very disturbing event because it demands a response. And to respond to it means some kind of inner revolution. It involves being made over, being made new, being born again. The desert is a place of revelation and revolution. So, the desert is is a place of revelation and revolution. John Chrysippus offers us insights into the desert, drawing on the experiences of the desert fathers and mothers. He writes, One place where men and women sought aggressively to understand the deeper meaning and the fuller measure of human existence was the desert of early Christian Egypt. They chose to live outside the towns and villages of the ancient world, as far as possible from civilised life, often entirely alone. They had very few possessions and wanted to have as little as possible, choosing to do without them in order to be free for God. They lived in handmade huts or in caves, eating and drinking a sparse diet of bread and herbs with water. Their clothing was that of the poorest people, a simple garment with a sheepskin that could be used as a blanket or rug. They were neither scholars nor preachers, neither teachers nor clerics. They came from all kinds of backgrounds, but mainly from that of poverty and need. They learned how to be still and silent, to know themselves before God, waiting on the Lord." That dry desert from the 3rd century until around the end of the 4th century became the laboratory for exploring hidden truths about heaven and earth and a forging ground 
for drawing connections between the two. The insights of the desert fathers and mothers have been gathered together under the Greek title Apothegmata ton Agion Geronton, literally the sayings of the holy elders. They are also known by the Latin title Verba Seniorum, the words of the elders. One of the most revered of the hermits was Moses the Black, an Ethiopian who'd been a highwayman before his conversion. He lived at Scatus, close to the Nile Delta. A brother came to Scatus to visit Abba Moses and asked him for a word. He replied, Go sit in your cell, and your cell will teach you everything. But the desert tradition was quite clear about one thing. Important as the hermit's cell in the desert is, the true cell is ultimately an inner place. So one of the desert mothers, Ama Synclectica, alerts us to the fact that you can be a solitary in your mind even when you live in the middle of a crowd. And you can be a solitary and still live in the middle of the crowd of your own thoughts. The social commentator Hugh McKay writes about our reluctance to make this inner journey. He makes an interesting observation when he says that we Australians are great at asking a question and immediately supplying an answer for the question we have just asked. So, for example, how you going? All right? But McKay has noticed that in recent times, the question has remained the same, but the answer we supply has changed. How you going? Busy? The preferred answer is, of course, busy. Flat out. McKay says, busy, busy has become a kind of mantra in our lives. Frantic busyness can be a wonderful hiding place, and keeping busy is one sure way of postponing those basic questions about the direction or quality of our lives. If you stay busy for long enough, you might never have time to reflect on the meaning of your work and the meaning of of your life. Alessandro Pronzato warns us that the desert isn't a panacea for all that may trouble us. If you go to the desert to be rid of all the dreadful and all the awful problems in your life, you will be wasting your time. You should go to the desert for a total confrontation with yourself, for one goes to the desert to see more and to see better. One goes to the desert especially to take a closer look at the things and people one would rather not see, to face situations one would rather avoid, to answer questions one would rather forget. So, here we have an agenda for Lent, to take a closer look at the things and people we would rather not see, to face situations we would rather avoid, and to answer questions we would rather forget. Pronzato warns us that the desert experience can't be rushed. The desert does not take kindly to those who tackle it at breakneck speed, subjecting it to their plans and deadlines. It soon takes its revenge and makes them pay dearly for their presumption. Instead, the desert welcomes those who shed their sandals of speed and walk slowly in their bare feet, letting them be caressed and burnt by the sand. If you have no ambition to conquer the desert, if you do not think you are in charge, if you can calmly wait for things to be done, then the desert will not consider you an intruder and will reveal its secrets to you. So, if you have no ambition to conquer the desert, if you do not think you are in charge, if you can calmly wait for things to be done, 
then the desert will not consider you an intruder and reveal its secrets to you.